So here's a uh, picture on the right of Flint, Michigan water pipes. I don't know if you remember this story. It's from a few years back. But uh, one of the things that happened in Flint is that they had really horrible water. And the, and the media was showing pictures, a lot of pictures of the sort of the rusty water that came out. But the biggest problem in Flint, Michigan was uh, lead in the water. And they had... In some households, they had as much as a thousand times the sort of limit of lead that they've deemed as an actionable level to that where something has to be done. But anyways, yeah, the pipes really look pretty horrible. But it's an interesting problem because uh, it really results from corrosion. And corrosion is mostly just unwanted or undesirable redox reactions that take place um, mostly on metal surfaces and so we have uh, things like aluminum iron uh, and, and a number of other building materials in this case uh, the culprit was lead so what was going on uh, here right could be understood a little bit in terms of redox reactions um, it's also understood a little bit in terms of solubility and solubility products, some of the things we've covered in the last chapter. Uh, worldwide, though, corrosion accounts for about $2.5 trillion a year in what needs to be repaired or replaced. And this is also uh, sort of um, is part of the problem we have with infrastructure in the United States where lots of things are in need of replacement. Thousands of bridges in the United States need to be replaced or fixed um, are generally in uh, poor repair and this is mostly due to corrosion. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I was going to say uh, one of the things about the pipes in Michigan is that uh, what happened and there's a very good story on this here you can see that link. Um, it's a little bit detailed, maybe, but it's probably at the level that you guys would enjoy reading it. What happened was, um, is Flint, Michigan changed its water source, and the pH uh, went from being a little bit more alkaline to a little bit more acidic. And also, uh, they didn't use uh, phosphate additions to their water. So the stuff called orthophosphate, or just phosphate, uh, wasn't added to the water. What phosphate does is it's uh, really good at precipitating out things like lead, and it causes uh, buildup on the inside of the pipe. So even though this looks horrible here, um, you do need buildup inside your pipe so that it sort of adds a protective layer to the water pipes. And that's why pipes just don't dissolve right away uh, in, in the ground. They're insulated, and then you get this a little bit of corrosion on the inside, and that causes a, a protective layer to form and then if you keep your water a little bit more alkaline because remember under basic pH conditions metals tend to be insoluble and then also if you had a precipitating agent like lead just a really small amount of it then what happens is uh, you protect the inside of the pipes from corrosion so in Flint what happened was they were trying to save money and they started pumping water out of the river uh, in Flint, Michigan, and um, they didn't treat it properly. So if you don't treat the water, keep the pH right, add the right additives to it, you get what happens uh, in Flint happening. And it could happen just about anywhere in the United States because there's so many lead pipes that were installed that nobody even knows where they're all at. So anyways, uh, potentially a big problem, is, but with a relatively easy fix in most places. And most places manage their water better than Flint did, and so... Most places don't have the same problems that Flint, Michigan had. Anyways, so here we have the reactions for the corrosion of iron. And it involves uh, the reduction of oxygen from the air. And then the anode reaction is, uh, the standard reduction reaction for the anode is iron 2 plus iron, uh, two electrons make iron uh, solid. But in the corrosion, if this is the anode, this is going to be running in the other direction. That gives us the spontaneous reaction. So what we'll do is we'll write it like this. 
and then that voltage becomes zero positive, right? 0 0.45 volts. So overall, there's a potential of about 1.68 volts adding uh, the cathode and anode reactions together. And it's a positive voltage, so it's spontaneous, right? So I wanted to show you, though, on the standard reduction tables that there are a number of metals that can corrode, and several that don't that should. So I'll get over to the... So this is actually the standard uh, reduction potentials or electrode potentials out of Appendix 2. And a while back when I printed this out, unfortunately, they used to put this in the middle of it. So you sort of have to live with that. We're all really going to look at this right-hand column. Because these are the, the reactions that relative to hydrogen are non-spontaneous, which means relative uh, to, um, as, as reductions, which means they're spontaneous as oxidation. So, so here we find iron at 0.45 volts, right? Um, but there's uh, nickel, cobalt. It turns out these two are relatively resistant to corrosion. And then um, here's aluminum. You notice aluminum it would be, as an oxidation, much more spontaneous. Um, but it's not. And so what's the reason for uh, a couple of these different metals not being um, susceptible to corrosion? And the primary reason on aluminum, and probably some of the other metals as well, is that when it oxidizes, what happens is the corrosion product, which is aluminum oxide, is actually very stable and so what it does is seals out the surface of the metal to further corrosion so even though aluminum should corrode it's a metal oxide layer on the outside that keeps water from being able to contact the surface and water is a key player in, and oxygen are key players in the corrosion of most metals so another thing I wanted to point out is it's a little bit hard to understand uh, some of the next slide in terms of this reaction, but this is the actual reaction that takes place. Uh, under neutral or acidic conditions, this is the redox reaction that we typically use for uh, doing like half reactions. There's also a base version of it. Now, uh, you'll notice that there's a hydrogen ion component in here. And as this reaction takes place, hydronium is being removed from the water. So what happens when hydronium gets removed from the water? Well, in essence, what it leaves behind is a basic solution or leaves behind some hydroxide. So what's going to be happening between the OH, which is generated by the use of the water, right? This H plus essentially comes from water. And, and, it, and the iron 2, which comes from this reaction, is these two form a precipitate. And this eventually further oxidizes to Fe2O3. And this is rust. Okay, so there's yet another reaction that takes place in between the precipitation of the hydroxide from this electrode, basically, to the uh, iron ion, the metal ion from this electrode. That precipitates out and eventually gets converted to Fe2O3. Now, when this happens in aluminum, the aluminum stays in place and forms. Uh, aluminum hydroxide or aluminum hydroxide and aluminum oxide and the aluminum oxide is inert to the corrosion so because it forms a layer it blocks out it separates out the aluminum surface from the potential source for the other redox reaction and so as a result it stays stable once an initial layer forms on the top otherwise aluminum is very reactive uh, in terms of um, redox potentials. So we'll, let me show you how this sets up on the next slide. And then um, I've also rewritten this reaction under basic conditions because I think it helps to um, emphasize that 
hydroxide is being made by this reaction. So what I did is I, I used the other form of this reaction. The way I did that is I went ahead and said, well, I'm going to add 4 OH minus, the same as when you do redox balancing, right? And I'm going to add 4 OH minus over here. So what that's going to do is produce, uh, f these two will produce 4 H2Os. And that'll cancel with these. And that's the reaction that we'll actually be looking at on the next slide, although it's the same reaction under acidic conditions here and under basic conditions here. So you'll see, oh, I got to make an editorial change. This I had listed as, I originally had the other reaction here, but I wanted to write this one because it kind of makes more sense. So this is the four hydroxides that I added. And then I canceled out, right, the two four waters here and two waters, so I cancel two of the waters out. And so this is the same redox reaction. It has a different voltage, and maybe I'll have a time to talk about that. But it has a different voltage um, because it's at a different pH, and this reaction is pH dependent. So this is what it looks like when it happens on a water drop, though, right? So here's the water drop on the surface. And the water drop is necessary, or helps in this case, because it gives a medium in which the ions can move about and meet each other. So the iron begins to rust, and when it begins to rust, it creates the anode for the reaction. Now, there may have been oxygen in this droplet before, but slowly this reaction consumes most of the oxygen in the droplet, and then what happens is oxygen can enter from the sides. Now, oxygen's entering from the top as well, so there's some of that going on as well, but what's really important to realize is oxygen's coming in along the sides here, and you're creating a cathode at the metal surface based on the oxygen reaction. So in one sense, the iron anode is the active electrode, and then the iron cathode on this end is the same piece of metal, but it's, it's inert. It's not actually participating in the reaction. It's just there to transfer for the transferal of electrons. So the anode pushes the electrons over to the cathode. It produces hydroxide over here iron over here and then what happens is they two meet and you form these little piles of rust so if you're looking at this from the top right let's uh that's the droplet you would expect to see some rusting in here and then there's actually a hole in the middle right here and this is known as the pit right so this is often referred to as pitting because what happens is when when rust forms on an iron surface it becomes very uh, irregular it's not smooth anymore and, and that process is called pitting and it happens because of the way this reaction takes place so important aspects to realize is all you really need is water you don't need a second electrode it's the same electrode but on both and on the different parts depending on the access to the oxygen you have a cathode on one side where the oxygen can, can reach and an anode in the middle where the pit forms and then the rust forms this sort of ring or blob, blob typically a blob around the pit. Now, um, there are some interesting conditions where we see rust and probably the most interesting, I can look out my window right now and I have a 1966 Mustang and is all rusted and needs a lot of work but imagine that you have a metal painted surface right and by the way the way you prevent corrosion is pretty simple is keep the water out okay that's one of the main ways that you can prevent corrosion and that's why we paint cars for example now so i have the surface i'm going to draw it like this there's iron under here, and it's been painted, right? And then all of a sudden, you get a chip in the paint. And then water hits it. And so now I have a water drop on top of my um, piece of metal, right? So where's the anode and where's the cathode in this situation? So I'm going to um, blow this up, right? I have a situation where essentially I've masked off the edges. And so I'm only looking at this one part here. So what happens is oxygen can reach the middle now, but it can't reach 
under the paint. So this becomes your anode here. So your anode is wherever the oxygen can't reach, and this becomes your cathode. So what's happening at this edge, right? The thing that happens at the edge is you begin to form iron oxide at the edge. And this actually, because it's sort of powdery, flaky nature, pushes the paint up. And then what happens is that little chip eventually gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, sometimes on the side of a car, what you'll see is it looks like the paint's all intact. So let's say this is the original car surface. And then the paint looks like this. And it's called a bubble. Okay. And the way the bubble actually forms is originally this was the hole. The oxygen's coming in here. The water is going in here. Okay. But what's happening is the anode is moving its way out. And it's actually filling this pocket full of rust. And if you take a knife and you cut that off or a scraper and you scrape that off, what you usually find is you find a layer of paint and then underneath it it's full of rust and this is all like rough and pockmarked. Uh, and that's the pitting of the uh, iron. So oxygen, a, a corrosion of oxygen and iron, right, is one of those ones that's the reason why it's... Uh, dangerous is structurally you can't see it most of the time it's actually hidden from sight uh, this happens with other kinds of metals too where you have corrosion that takes place but it's not taking place where you can see it and that's because the iron right is the anode and it's dissolving you only need a small region in which for the oxygen and the water intrusion to take place for corrosion to take place over a long time one of my other favorite um, corrosion examples is if you go to the ocean, a lot of the times you'll see like an old pier. So you'll see a pier and then you'll see an old pier next to it. And then in this, let's say this is the water, right, for the old pier. What you see is you see a bunch of pilings like this. And they're all cut off around water level. And, and I used to think to myself, why would they cut those off there? Right? Why would they, why would they just pull them out? And the answer is, they didn't even try to, they didn't cut them off. It's corrosion that cut it off. And the reason it happens, again, has to do where the anode is and where the cathode is. And remember, the anode is the part that weakens. So even though the ocean level isn't completely constant, right? When you're looking at the surface, where does the oxygen come from, right? Hopefully you know this answer. It comes from the air, right? So it comes from up here. So your, that's your, your, your cathode is, was originally above the water, and this is your anode. And because there's less oxygen underwater, which we all hopefully know, there's less oxygen, breathable oxygen underwater, eventually what happens is this appears to just cut right off. Right, because it's corroding right at the water line. Even though the thing is going up and down, the tide is going up and down. These things corrode at the water line, and eventually they, they topple off. And these old piers often had like iron pilings that they used, the ones that you're seeing. Um, and yeah, they just sort of fell off that way. You see pipes in water that way as well. Like somebody stuck a pipe in the water uh, for like a dock. Um, in, a, in a freshwater lake, you see the same kind of behavior. Way down here, it doesn't look bad, and at top, it doesn't look bad, but all the corrosion is taking place at the interface between the pipe and the water. So, corrosion is a big problem, so what do people do about it? And it turns out there's actually several things that are pretty commonly done. Uh, one is simply just to paint the surface. To stop corrosion, all you need to do is cover it up. So the Golden Gate Bridge, for example, is that bright red um, because primarily they were trying to paint the surface of the metal over uh, because salt water, because it provides uh, conductivity in the solution, is a great uh, like facilitator of corrosion. So cars in the Midwest, for example, uh, generally tend to rust out a lot faster because a common practice in the Midwest when there's snow is to salt the roads. And the other option is sometimes they use gravel. Well, the gravel just 
helps to chip the paint and then if they salt the roads it helps just to corrode the bodies of the cars away uh, i had a friend uh, i still remember who's now like an executive for uh, like 3m or something like that for uh, for uh, uh, their chemical uh, business but what <laughs> i used to ride in his car in graduate school and he came from detroit michigan um, and his car you could actually see through the floor uh, of his car because it was so corroded you were afraid that if you stuck your foot there there was no metal left hardly and you could see the the road rolling by underneath your feet so corrosion was really bad in the midwest so this slide was a little messy i don't know if you can tell i rearranged it but uh so we use something called a sacrificial anode so besides painting and coating the surface over uh, one of the things that we do is we also use uh, another more reactive metal for uh, protecting the iron uh, in the reaction so again we have corrosion and I've written these as standard reductions because I wanted to show you how this sets up on a standard reductions table but we have aluminum uh, we have oxygen being reduced and that's a voltage of 1.23 volts and then these are the standard reduction potentials for uh, iron zinc and uh, magnesium now you have to remember these are written as reductions but when you uh, run the reaction right you're going to flip it and the sign will change to positive but if you think about the potential energy difference between this point and this point right we calculated i believe we calculated that earlier but that's about 1.63 volts that's the energy available to the chemical reaction now if you think about this reaction right this is approaching two volts this is one or sorry yeah 1.99 volts right and this reaction and a difference here going from here to here is about 3.61 volts so you'll notice what's happening if if I were to take um, a piece of iron and attach a piece of zinc to it there would be more free energy available to the reaction right by oxidizing the zinc in preference to oxidizing the iron if we look at uh, magnesium right there's much much more free energy remember positive free energy is spontaneous much more free energy for the oxidation of magnesium versus the oxidation of zinc or the oxidation of iron and this is the principle that a sacrificial anode works on in essence what we're doing is we're going to connect to the iron electrode right to the anode we're going to connect something that oxidizes more easily and in preference what happens is the reduction reaction utilizes the most spontaneous reaction that's available now if you think about this in contrast to an electrolytic reaction electrolytic reactions if we were doing the electrolysis for example of all three of these uh, ions in solution preferentially the iron would be reduced in an electrolysis reaction because what electrolysis does is it prefers to use the reaction with the least amount of energy but in spontaneous reactions if you think about a ball rolling down the hill right if it could roll down to these different points it always prefers in the long run to go from the highest potential energy that's available to the lowest so you always get the most energy possible out of a voltaic cell which is what uh, corrosion is is a a type of voltaic uh, arrangement you always get the most energy out that's possible in practice it looks something like this you take a steel pipe that you don't want to corrode you attach a sacrificial anode made out of magnesium and then uh, what happens is as this pipe corrodes or as it tries to be oxidized what happens is the magnesium in preference oxidizes itself to keep the iron in a reduced state so 
these sacrificial animals are used everywhere and if you have an older house and you go to one of the pipes on the outside of your house you'll often find a wire attached uh, to one of the pipes and the reason for the wire is that that wire goes down into the ground and buried somewhere underneath your house is a sacrificial anode typically these are magnesium or aluminum or zinc type blocks now one of the things I have mentioned before, and this is just methods of preventing corrosions, we use sacrificial anodes, we paint surfaces, and another thing that you can do is you can do a zinc coating on the surface. Now if you look at zinc, zinc is more reactive to oxidation than iron is, and as a result, if you put a zinc coating on top of iron, then it will do two things. One, the metal coating will prevent water from coming into contact with the iron, and the second thing that happens is if you break the metal surface, and where you see this most often, right, is on a nail. And we call these gal galvanized nails. But on the surface of the galvanized nail, there's a layer of zinc. So even if you were to break the surface and the iron would try to be oxidized, it has this coating of zinc that works as a sacrificial anode to keep it from corroding away. Now over time, that eventually will give out, and then at that point, then the iron begins to rust. And by, what I mean by give out is you use up all the zinc trying to prevent the oxidation of the iron. Now, besides sacrificial anodes, painting, metal coatings uh, to eliminate oxygen, and then metal coatings to help uh, act as a sacrificial anode on like a nail, or sheet metal, a lot of times you get galvanized uh, metal coatings, right? Surf, uh, metal sheets that you put on roofs and things like that. Um, they also do uh, active, um, how to say, it, prevention of corrosion by simply hooking the pipe up to an electrical circuit and keeping it at a more negative voltage. And that negative voltage then is used to maintain uh, the iron in the pipe or the bridge at a negative potentials to keep the iron in the reduced state. And then more recently, um, they've started developing coatings to put on metals, which not only do they uh, protect the metal from oxygen, uh, but they also bind to any ions that are on the surface. And one of the things that you have to have in every electrochemical cell is you have to have mobility of ions. And what they do with these uh, coatings now is they put uh, cations and anions in the coatings to prevent the movement of ions on the surface. And so basically these are bound charges in the matrix of the paint. And then the, when you have ions formed on the surface, they're not allowed to move because of the restriction created by the coating. So that about covers it for this chapter. Um, corrosion is the last thing, I think, in the textbook as well. If you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Give me a call or give me a text and let me know.